I don't know why I didn't connect the dots on this until last night, but you coached Prime at uh, the U18s. I'm assuming you're meeting Chloe Permarano. Yes. <laughs> she's the best. Yeah, she's great. It was a, it was a pleasure to coach her. I was the hockey director at the North Shore Winter Club, and I my last year there, I coached our Pee Wee team that she was on. And um, oh no way! Yeah, she's just uh, so I her and I like every week we were one on one doing I kind of working with defensemen's kind of my shtick and. Um, I, I, the best compliment I could pay to her is that if she was the worst player on your team, you'd still want her there just because she's impo- it's impossible to be in a bad mood around her. That's a good way of putting it. That's a really good way of putting it. Yeah, she's a great kid. Great kid. Um, so it's game day. Um, when you're not podcasting, I'm assuming this isn't a part of your regular game day cadence. What? Tell me what your, your routine is. And I'd be curious to know, any any um, aspects of your coaching game day routine, which may be borrowed from what you, the process you went through as a player? Uh, probably just lots of coffee would be the one thing that has uh, stayed the same, maybe more so as a coach. Um, but no, I don't really have like I have a few things that I, I like to do, but I'm pretty flexible, to be honest. Um, we my, I have some superstitious staff members that um, if we ever get on a streak, they like to do the same thing. Um, but we like to go get some chips and dip once in a while down the street at our favorite Mexican spot. And um, other than that, we just uh, get ready for the game. I've had a couple of uh, coaches from Boston on the show before. And one thing you mentioned coffee, one thing that comes up, it's like there seems to be a real alliance there. Like you're either a Duncan person. I think it was maybe was it Jack Parker who was on the show. And it was like he had the same order, like it was ready to go every time he showed up for however many generations he coached for what's what's your uh what's your go-to i am starbucks all the way um definitely haven't gotten into the duncan um i uh it switches up a little bit i'm into kind of the uh take on the shaken espresso um a little bit of a leaner option um but also love just a straight like uh pike with an extra shot or a flat white so i have a few different go-tos awesome so you're playing tonight round one of the playoffs. It's a play in game against Holy Cross. You've played in a lot of big games. Um, what information do you feel is critical to give your players um, heading into a game like this? I think at this point, it's just having confidence in your preparation and helping them play light, helping them play free and, uh, and confident. And um, it's all about the mentality that you go into this game with. So that's all we've been trying to do for uh, the first couple of days this week. And, um, and we'll see how it goes. I'm always uh, fascinated because I think this is part of the, I guess, the art of coaching where there's a blank canvas and there's no right or wrong answers. There's just, you know, everybody can have their own approach. But um, in, in terms of gaining perhaps momentum, um, in, in a game like this or any playoff game, is there any objectives that you might set for your team to say, hey, we really want to focus on funneling pucks to the net or we really want to focus on turnovers on the back check? Um, how do you help players direct their focus? For sure. We have all year, we have um, kind of our pillars of success and we have a handful of habits that we focus on no matter what. Um, and a handful of tactics that we focus on and kind of depending on our opponent you just really shift which area you really want to hone in on right they're always going to be staples of our game Um, but for us to your point it is building momentum and a couple areas I think to focus on for us is is always going to be our changes Um, that's uh, your length of them but also how to change how to change the possession um, how to keep territorial advantage and I think, you know, if you do that, um, you're just you're going to create that energy mismatch and your likelihood of scoring is that much higher. So for us, it always it comes down to that and creating those quality scoring chances. I can guarantee you that there's a lot of people listening right now. When you talked about line changes, there's probably a lot of coaches that just not, not in a bad way, but they probably just assume that it's an afterthought. What might be a couple of keys when it comes to line changes or how might you work on that, say, in practice? Or how, how do you sharpen that skill? Mm, I could talk about it all day. Uh, oh, man. I, I, I have guess... a conference topic here. Might have a conference topic <laughs> We here. might. We might. Yeah. I think you know, all too often, I'm sure, you know, in the minor hockey levels, girls are just yelled at or players in general, like, 
better changes or shorter shifts. But what I truly try to help our girls understand is the the purpose behind it and how it's going to actually benefit you um, and setting that next lineup for success. So I kind of say there's three or four ways that you want to end your shift. And it's all about managing the end of your shift. The best way you can end your shift, scoring a goal. It's the best way you can obviously end your shift. <laughs> When you said that, when you said there's four ways, like scoring a goal didn't even occur to me. Right. I'm that's like, great. I probably yeah. should add that one in there. Cause that's, I guess what we want them to do when they're out there. Yeah. But second best way to end your shift is change with possession in the offensive zone. So changing one at a time, setting that next line up for success. Um, the third best way is keeping territorial advantage. And there's two ways. So one is if we purposefully deposit the puck in the offensive zone and maybe one, one person stays. They try to yeah. delay the other team's four check and we get two fresh people on. And then worst case scenario, if we are tired, we just got hemmed in, we're trying to shift momentum, you use your wholesale change play that kind of sets you up into a little bit of a trap and you try to stop them from starting their shift in our D zone. So those are kind of the four areas and ways that we really try to give them purpose. So it's not sure. just yelling like better changes, it's giving them a direction uh, and go from there. I've never taken over an NCAA Division One program. But if I did, I feel like one of the challenges would be there's probably just a mountain of information that you want to force feed your players. There's all these changes. You probably want to put new slogans on the wall. Like there's just, there's probably never enough hours in the day. When you were presented this opportunity, how have you, like, have you, have you taken that sort of fire hose approach of, 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 inf- of you know, feeding your players and staff information or has there maybe been a, a process or system to sort of build this incrementally over time? Yeah, it's a great question. I think a couple things in my career so far have served me and it's a completely different challenge. You know, I built the program from scratch at Stonehill. And yeah. so the two things that are similar in both of those things is that you're onboarding an entire team. It's not like your seniors, juniors, and sophomores kind of know the foundation and you're just bringing freshmen in to onboard them. Both In both ways, you're onboarding your vision and your concepts to a completely like an entire group. And you're trying to do that through the course of preseason. Um, what I think makes it doing what's the more difficult part with taking over a program is not only are you bringing your philosophy, you have to almost help them believe in it versus what they were doing. Uh, for whether it's a seniors for three years or sophomores for juniors for two. Um, But luckily what I've tried to do in both of these scenarios for me, because I've had experience coaching at the international level um, is try to apply that short-term competition type of mindset and know that our preseason is so short that you can only cover so much. And so I kind of took my international experience a little bit with regards to just the very beginning, our preseason, get comfortable with teaching as you go through the year. And so trying to lay the foundation for your habits um, and your key concepts that will translate to every zone of the ice, that will translate to different systems sure. um, and try to kind of just have uh, have confidence knowing you can roll everything out as the year goes on. I like that. I like that. As you've gone through the year and, it, you know, you, you took over a program that I would say that the ceiling is, is above you. So you're, you're trying to trend upwards. Um, I, I would, I would think that you can't always measure things simply by wins and losses. Um, what would be some of the underlying things that you would pay attention to say on a weekly basis to, to measure or to have a pulse on, on, on whether you're making, you know, the right improvements, you know, beyond just what's going on in the standings. For sure. And this has been, um, a fun way to really test that because I've always believed it's not about the wins and losses and you get to, you know, this level and a program I care about so much and staying true to that. And some things that we look, we track our habits every game. Um, we track our, the tactics we focus on every game and we try to use those as our benchmarks and help those There's stats or stats, but help utilize them and correlate. Like, are we playing our game? Are we controlling the things that we can control? Um, And that's kind of our foundation. And then from there, I think you look at things like, well, one of those tactics is how many quality scoring chances are you creating? How do you make your offense opponent proof, goalie proof, right? And it's not just good enough getting shots on net, but creating those quality looks. And then how much possession time do you have in general? How much possession time do you have in the offensive zone versus the other team? 
And I like to think if you really strive for those things and focus on those things that, you know, it will come. The wins will come. Got it. Um, I look at um, New England Patriots, for example. Uh, new coach, previous coach, had a pretty good uh, run um, for, I think, 24 seasons. But it, just as recently as this morning, you know, Jared Mayo was was quoting the paper saying, hey, like, I'm going to make changes. It's going to be different. And that's by no means – because I think, obviously, the media is maybe trying to spin it as him. He's throwing shade at Bill Belichick. But – I think it just it's it's for anybody that's been in coaching like obviously as you're you know building up your career you're you're taking in information and some of that you're saying hey when I get my shot this is going to be a part of my program you know, just again I think you have such a diverse background as both a player and a coach you know I think they will dive into the experience at Stonehill but what would have been some of the things that you would point to and say this is kind of like you know the DNA of of what I've tried to install here yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing that I've learned over the course of my career and that privilege of playing at the highest levels um, is getting the culture to a place where, A, you feel like you can be yourself every day and yeah. you truly want the best for the person next to you. And and I like you go to that Hockey Canada Olympic experience when 27 players are centralized and only 23 go, and it's a nine-month-long tryout, and I was always a bubble player. And if there's one of the biggest things that stuck with me is I stopped overthinking the lineup. I stopped thinking about what other players are doing. I was in the moment. I enjoyed my teammates' company. I was all in, and I wanted our team to succeed, and I always played better. How did, I'm just curious. I mean, I think that's – so well said, but, and I think that experience you described with, with the women's national team is so unique, but was that a product of like the veteran players just sort of having that walking into the culture and that's just the way it was? Was it, was somebody coaching you up in that? Cause I, I don't, I would say what you just described is against human nature. It really is. And that's where, you know, you spoke about it earlier, the art of coaching. I, I, there's no, I don't think there's one algorithm you can apply to every team and every group yeah. of people. But I think what I learned from that year is that when you have a plan tactically, culturally, and you're really thought out in how you're going to build your culture and build your strategy, um, you're able to adapt in that and you're able to make adjustments where you need to. And I, and I always felt like with Hockey Canada, like I believed in the bigger plan. And I think that had me buy in more as a player um, and slowly just had me enjoying the moment. But like, I always believed in the long-term plan that they had. Um, and so I guess I tried to take a lot of those things and being thoughtful about every arm of your program and how you build it um, and hoping that you create that environment where eventually you can mentor players to get to that point. But still figuring it out as yeah. we go. It's a lot easier said than done, that's for sure. Yeah, I think that's that that's the the stick, right? It's always a work in progress. Um, you know, we've we've had a couple of your counterparts coaches um uh at, at the NCAA level. And, you know, I just the one that comes to mind is Kara Mori talking about not as a coach, but as a player, when she went to Brown, it was the first time she had her own locker room. And I, again, I think unless you've been a part of this, it's not obvious, but she just pointed out, she's like the gap from being a female, like a high end female player to the NCAA level. She says it's such a big jump. And she, she pointed out that, you know, such a big part of the coaching process is you're just trying to bring them into an environment where obviously they're watching video all the time, like their strength and conditioning, like they have their own locker room. They got like, there's just all these things. And and she said, she just pointed out again, I just thought that was so interesting. She said like the onboarding process. So with that in mind, how, you know, and you've lived it yourself. How do you onboard players to, to, to all of a sudden be in an environment where, you know, one, there's a lot of resources, but with resources comes pressure and expectations and maybe uh, a, a lot more that they have to be accountable and responsible for throughout the week. For sure. It's uh, one of my favorite parts about this age level and coaching in college is that they are transitioning to being full on adults that are taking ownership over their career. And I think first and foremost is trying to create that safe environment and trust so that, you know, they I want to help shift their mindset and that these resources are there for them, um, including us. 
our, our job as coaches is to help you play your best and achieve your dreams. And if they can look at us as that and, and turn it into where I feel like in minor hockey, it's coaches tell you what to do and you do it. And if the coach thinks you're good, then that's success. But teaching them how to redefine success in a more sustainable way and, and really create that iterative process to where it's my job to work with you now right? I'm not going to coach at you. I'm going to coach with you. And we're going to take your skill set that you've already worked so hard for. And we're going to help strategize about how to make that impactful at this level. Um, And then also teach them how to define success in a way that like, you can play well and not score. You can play poorly and get a lot of points in games. Like, how do you take your game and learn how to define success for yourself aside away from your parents, away from me, away from all the externals. And I think that's all of our job is, is to help teach them how to be leaders of their careers and just use us as resources throughout all of it. So that's been, uh, and that's obviously like everything else, easier said than done. Uh, But that's the approach that I try to take is to really build that trust and um, have them start to take ownership over it. And and I and I'm sure that that sort of approach or mindset, like that's going to lend lend itself to every aspect of their life long after they've they've left the program. Um, I look at the the hockey East standings, and there's you know lots of stats. And I was poking around it, and one thing that was, and I don't know if this is just a you know one of those years where maybe it's more obvious, but when you looked at the goals for and goals against, and particularly the goal differential. It's a it, the conference is super tight. A um, lot of parity, I think, outside. I think from like second place down to uh, seventh place. Um, but you could sort of see with that goal differential, like you could see the impact it had on wins and, and, and points. And when when you're looking at your team and saying, okay, like a couple of goals are going to be is, is clearly going to be the difference. How do you do you focus on scoring more goals or simply you know, preventing more goals or is it a balance of saying, Hey, we've got to sort of try and manage both ends. Um, how, how do you approach that throughout a season? For sure. And that's a good way of putting it. And I don't think it's one or the other. You have to look at the strengths of your program um, and, and lean into those. I think yeah. uh, for us, funny enough, I know the, the group last year had trouble scoring. Um, and I had played around with this idea with Team Canada, actually with the U18s, based on different factors, but kind of started with offense first. Um, we started with offense first throughout preseason to create chemistry, um, and then you sell defense with offense. Um, but I, the way that we teach defense is so concept-focused. It's not super structured. Um, so I think it has, it has to be focused on both areas, but I think the ultimate goal to come back to the very beginning of our conversation comes down to building momentum. And defense creates transitional offense, which is the high-quality stuff you want. Um, and hanging on to momentum with good defensive habits is going to help you create better offense long-term anyway. So it's constantly coming back to just trying to create momentum in the game um, and set yourself up for scoring more goals. But um, it is so, so deep in our league and um, it's uh, been interesting to see. For what it's worth, I want to play for the coach that teaches defense through offense. I think that I think <laughs> that, that concept might catch fire coming out of this. That was um, step one in building their, building <laughs> their excitement yeah. begin the year. <laughs> I bet. I bet. So this morning I wake up, I got a little guy, five years old, loves hockey. And, and every morning he knows if he's, you know, does his chores, does his things, he gets to watch, you know, the uh, Canucks game start at seven o'clock at home. Anyways, we get to watch the first 10 minutes of the first period. It's bedtime. And then in the morning when he has breakfast, he's allowed to watch the highlights. And I'm watching him this morning. And I think, you know, I look at how passionate he is about the game and I, I I'm looking at him. And I'm like, man, what would it be like if he had this passion but the NHL didn't exist. And then when he was 19 or 20, all of a sudden the NHL came out of nowhere and there was a path to play profession. I was thinking, I'm thinking about your players. Like we maybe take for, I mean, the PWHL has been just awesome. And I I can only imagine where it's going to be in two, three, five years, but for your players, now that they get to come to the rink and there's, there's a horizon um, that isn't just playing on the national team. How much is that 
changed the energy inside your program? And, and, and maybe beyond that, how much has it changed the fact that from a coaching perspective, now there's a little bit of a carrot dangling where it's like, you know, ice time and toe on the line maybe means a bit more. Mm, yeah, I think I'm starting to feel the second part a little bit more than the first part. I think a lot like just with just the up and downs of the leagues that have existed before the PWHL, I think to an yeah. extent how much the girls were excited they also are kind of just like, oh, we're still in our comfort zone. We're still in the safety yeah. of the college landscape. Let's see how this plays out. But it's been cool to see, especially for your upperclassmen, um, as the year has gone on and the PWHLs continue to thrive and gain traction, I think you're starting to see that built up of excitement of being like, wow, I got something to play for. And, and hey, like, it might not be that easy to get there either. Like, it, like it's going to be, you know, it's going to be yeah. tough to crack those lineups, let alone an Olympic lineup, right? And which has been the landscape always before this, but you can definitely feel it building. And I think that's really, really cool. And what I'm, what I love about when you think about college athletics and development, that's what it's all about. And so now in a lot of ways, to your point, like you can have the conversation with players and to everything we said before, like, it's my job to help you achieve your dream. So let's talk about now, but let's also talk about how if we make, some like if we invest in some growth here it's going to help you down the road so you're yeah. really getting to like invest in their growth uh over a long term and not just peaking by the end of college got it i had um um a, a friend who's a um working as an agent for some players in the pwhl and he pointed out that there's a, a level of uh, physical contact in that league now that maybe hasn't existed. And, and one of the, the things there's a concern about are the players have expressed to him and say like, Hey, like I just not really prepared for this. Like I'm not used to going back to retrieve pucks and there's the opportunity where I'm going to get bumped pretty hard. And, you know, just from a, an outsider's perspective, I've seen at the international level, particularly when Canada plays the U S Oh, every year it seems it gets this, I don't want to say the stakes get higher, but it's definitely more physical. And I would argue that the entertainment value, not in a gladiator sort of way, but it's just, it's better. It seems like a better product. Um, how much of that kind of factors into your coaching, just preparing players, you know, and, and maybe forget the PWHL, but just preparing players of the game seems to be getting more physical. But now that, you know, maybe aspiration where they want to end up, that's that's something that you might have to prepare them for. Yeah, I love it personally. And I know I was always maybe more of a yeah, physical player <laughs> in uh, my career. But I think what I love about it the most is that the game is going to get more physical when it's Canada in the U.S. because you're in an enclosed ice surface and the people are faster and stronger and there's going to be contact. And the same thing with the professional hockey. But now that they're letting it go, you're really seeing it being utilized effectively in how contact is a part of the game. But what I love about it now is that I can really sell that focus on a functional skill set. There are so many players that get to college that have gaps because their five foot skill set so good. They can skate with a puck like crazy when they have time and space. They can rush it end to end, but how much are they coming off the wall with it? How much are they making five foot passes out of the corner? How much are they able to shoot off the pass in tight spaces? Like, that those type of skills lack and the ability to play with others. And I've always, I felt that as a player in my career, making the jump from college to the national program and the players that stayed the longest were the ones that can do those things that have that functional skill set. So what I'm really excited about now is that you can sell it even more. Like these are the yeah. skills that are going to help you have an impact at every level. And every time you're on the ice, not just when the other team gives you a breakaway. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the rivalry with Canada and the U S and, and this has always fascinated me because I don't, I think there's a documentary, like I'm watching the, the Patriots dynasty doc right now, which is awesome. And I know we've seen like the last dance. Like, I think there's a version of that that needs to be told between Canada and the U S because this environment where like, not just for years, like for generations, it's been two teams. Like you talked about, I mean, when you talk about that nine month tryout, it's basically like a, a nine, it's like a playoff series for nine months to get the <laughs> chance to go have another series yeah. at an international event. Um, and the only thing I could, I could sort of think of, could compare it to would be like maybe in tennis or golf where you have like, you know, Nadal and, and Jokovic, you know, that are just every year playing in, in majors. Um, 
Can you maybe just take us inside the psychology of being on one of those two sides and, and having consistently having a step into the ring with the same opponent and figure it out all over? Because it's, it's got to be a pretty small, as, as much as it's competitive, I imagine it's a very small community as well. And you're all trying to grow the game. Yeah, it's funny you said that at the end, because that's initially where my mind went to having gone through it, is that by the time you really get to be maybe a more consistent player on your senior national team, you know, you've gone through college and you've played with a lot of them and against them at this point, like going yeah. through the NCAA route. Um, and then you get to pro now. And I actually, I played on the Boston team when I was playing professionally uh, in my career. So I played with a lot of the American Olympians too. Um, so there is a familiarity. Um, and I think ultimately what I learned as I went through my career is like, there is just that mutual respect for the lifestyle sure. you have to live and the commitment and everything it took to get there. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, um, uh, you're so, it's so hard to make our programs. It's so hard to make your national team that I think there is like a level of focus on that before you even start to think about the rivalry. And then once you're kind of, once you're in it, you're just like, you're, you're fired up to play the U S right. And I think, yeah. I think it's more so it's a mutual respect. It's a, a drive to want to win. It's, you know, it's going to be the best hockey that you get to play. Um, and, and you want to have those, you know, you want to be on top of the world at the end of it all. For sure. Um, you, you mentioned earlier your time in Stonehill. So I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So you were there for two seasons. It was the inaugural season. Like it was a new program. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at some point when the, uh, Tara Watchhorn book on coaching comes out, what, what is the chapter on your Stonehill experience going to look like? And what would maybe be some of the key lessons where you're like, man, if I didn't go through that, I probably don't learn this thing that's going to serve me well the rest of the way. Great question. Yeah. So with Stonehill, what made it unique was I only had one season where we played. I was there for two years total, but the first year was building the program, literally recruiting the amount of players to, to have a team. Um, so I think that the biggest thing, first and foremost, I was still very young in my coaching career. You know, I was lucky that right out of retirement at the age of 27, Brian DeRocher hired me to start at my alma mater and be an assistant coach at Boss University. And it's your dream job. And there is a big part of me that I'm like, I could stay here forever. Um, you know, but I started working with Team Canada and I started to get some camp experience of being a head coach here and there. And, you know, and COVID happened, you had way more time to start thinking about your vision and all the things that you might want to do. And the Stonehill job opened up, long story short. And um, so I think the biggest thing I learned was how to make shifts in your career and what makes the most sense for you and where your strengths are and how to find alignment um, for your vision. And so the process of really scary, like I never wanted to go down the street and work at a rival, like division one school, or like the fact that Stonehill was a brand new program was exciting. I could go there and build my vision and um, have a fresh start. And that year to build as a really young and new head coach was going to allow me to get experience with the administrative side of things as a head coach and all the nuances that come that aren't hockey. So I had, I felt like that move for me was beneficial for where I was at in my career and my skill set as a coach. And so I think that transition is first what I learned the most from, um, being willing to make that move, knowing that it was hopefully going to benefit me long term and to get to do something that is pretty special, uh, getting to, you know, leave your mark on building something. But the process of acquiring players, recruiting, building out your scholarship model, um, trying to ingrain yourself in the community that's there and build your vision from that. Um, there, there was so much, but I mean, I really could talk about Stonehill for a long time, but we ended up bringing in 18 freshmen and that dynamic wow. alone of working with 18 yeah. freshmen was really, really cool. Like the pros are there, like they're, you just recruited them and got them to the division one level and they just are ready to eat it up. And to be able to mold the culture out of that was in a lot of ways, a little bit easier um, starting from scratch, but you go through the highs and lows of what a freshman year is. And it's, you're managing people first. That's for sure. <laughs> before hockey even gets to be a part of it. Well, I, I I've said this a lot, but just for, I don't know how many years it's been now that we've been, doing this show and, and how many of the, the like really high level coaches, like NHL coaches 
got their start in the East Coast League and probably a little bit of a similar dynamic. And they're like, the education wasn't so much in the X's and O's, but it's like, it's like you don't have a lot of people on staff or resources. Like you're kind of doing everything. You're booking team meals. You got to get the bus. You got to understand all of a sudden, like you retire from playing and somebody's handing you a budget for the first time, your time management yeah. skills, because as you said, you're probably between recruiting and being in the community. Did, did you feel like, did you feel prepared for that? And again, do you, do you think maybe in hindsight, you can look back and say, gosh, like kind of having to have a, learn how to have a bunch of plates spinning has served you well, because I'm sure there's a, a different, but equally, you know, I guess similar element that you're probably getting pulled in a million different directions in your current role too. Yes, 100%. And that was one thing that having that year to build and not be jumping right into a hockey season and managing uh, like 20 something young women right off the bat really allowed me to like prepare for that in a lot of ways. And it is, and it's what I knew in the moment, like wearing a lot of hats was going to serve me down the road. Like when you know what we built up, like a a army of student managers that like helped and supported us. And you know, you, anyone that was willing to be a part of our program, like come on in and make that culture around your staff to where people feel connected and want to be a part of it. And how do you delegate and utilize, but you still know when you're in that type of situation, like, you know how every arm of the program works. And now when you get into this role and when you have more resources on a bigger stage a little bit, it definitely helps. And I think the first and foremost helps build that staff culture that you really want, because ultimately that's going to help what you want your team culture to be. You know, you're, you're obviously in Boston because it's your alma mater. Touched on that, but um, I understand your, your husband Brandon is, is from Boston as well. He's a police officer. I'd be curious to know when you guys are sitting down at the dinner table at the end of the day, and I mean maybe that doesn't happen every night, but when it does, like, what are those conversations like? Because maybe there's not an obvious crossover, but I could see where you guys might be able to pull. There might be some similar type of experience and just in how you're dealing with people. You nailed it. Yeah. Well, like you said, doesn't happen maybe as often as, as we like it. And first she has to tell me to stop talking about hockey once in a while. Um, (laughs) But we eventually, and when we started dating when I was in college and he was police officer, that, that was the similarity. It was working in teams and leadership and working with people. And it really always does come down to that. And like some of the most valuable, you know, pieces of advice and conversations we had uh, like have regularly that is you know the intersects our work environment is that and it is it's it's really cool and that's always been something that's really you know connected us um and he's a big hockey fan but he definitely that's more on that level of leadership teamwork and people is where it connects um okay so he's a hockey fan so when i'm doing the math there's so is it, when's the next Winter Olympics? 2026 in Italy. You guys are sitting in the living room. It's Canada and the U.S. in the, in the finals. Um, who, who's cheering for who? Like, is there is there a wager, household wager going on? Is somebody doing the dishes, if, depending on who loses? <laughs> um, him being with me through my Olympic experience, he'll say he'll always cheer for Team Canada. Uh, he's very patriotic and um, likes to root for the U.S. in a lot of things, but you more see it in other parts of uh, our lives. But when it comes to hockey, he's always going to be a Team Canada fan. You led Team Canada recently at the U18 uh, World Championships, mm-hmm. and um Look, look like a stacked roster. You get into the semifinals, and I, I think the margin, the shot margin, was approximately four to one. Um, but you lose to the, the Czechs in the semifinals. Um, being a Canadian, you never want to see that. Um, being a coach, you understand that that's that happens. It's a very real part of the game, and it's it, it's not easy to deal with. Because I think we've all been in that moment where you kind of hit a threshold in the game where you're dominating and maybe the puck's not going and it gets tighter and it can almost work against you. And the third part of it, I'm like, this is, this is kind of good for the game, you know, in in that there's some other dance partners here and then it's a different narrative. Um, But, but maybe going back to just the part and how you manage a game like that as a coach, um, what do you take away from that? Yeah, I think so much to learn from it. And as you know, as a coach, those one in 100 games happen and you're constantly yeah. just trying to do whatever you can do to to control and avoid that. But they happen. And I think that like I learned so much from the entire experience. And I think it starts before you even get to that game. 
right? Like it's, and it's the art of coaching. You have a plan and how do you tailor your plan and push here and pull back here and, and find those moments to just build that mentality and culture to where you're, you're going to be able to get out of those games. Um, and I think, so that's the biggest thing is more big picture learning. Like the, we went to yeah. the snake format that this year. So now all of a sudden we're playing Germany. It's like, we're not playing our top four teams in a pool and bottom four. Like we played oh. Germany and yeah, Czech yeah. and, um, you know, uh, other teams going into it. So like yeah. you said, we have a stacked roster. You're not facing adversity through the tournament as much and you know, it's going to hit somewhere. So how do you insert adversity potentially, or how do you, change the messaging how do you define success and you know we tried to be really mindful about it throughout the entire tournament um in terms of you know really pushing like that quality scoring chances versus just getting goals right having high standards for how we play um so learned a lot that way Dustin had a maybe big picture you know make tweaks here and there but yeah in game I think it's just trying to let them play light um but I think more so the more you can impact it is the preparation leading up to that game and learning a lot about kind of, like you said, the art of coaching that way. When, when you talked about that, that culture that you experienced as a player where um, it was all about the team, you, you were happy for your teammates success. W- was that ingrained with your group or was that something maybe starting out where you had a, it, maybe take some proactive steps to make sure that that existed. Cause I could see, you know, you know, Coaching a, a roster of really talented players is, is great, but there's a there's a flip side to that where you're managing ice time, egos, et cetera. And again, that's that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's little things that you can do, but there's no there's no I think set answer and how to manage it. But you know, I think the hard thing for the U18 level that I'm seeing, I've got to work for World Championships now, is it's the first time they ever put the jersey on. It's so special, and they're all in, and then you make the team. And if you think about it, being in the hockey can environment, it's the first time they're receiving feedback formally from Hockey Canada, how they view it, right? So whether that's Mm -hmm. you got two shifts or 10 shifts, they're internalizing every moment as what does this mean for my future in the program? Because every one of them wants to go to an Olympics. And so it's trying to build that trust and transparency of saying like, you can have long careers and the professional league helps this, right? Like you don't have to be the best player on this U18 team with the most points in the tournament to become an Olympian. This is just this first step for you. And it's how you grow from this experience. But I think it's really hard to counter that natural human mindset of being like every part of this experience is feedback and determining my future and trying to take that stress off of the table for them and let them just play. But it is, it's, it's the dynamic is really interesting, but it's, um, it's pretty special. Just as you said, that just occurred to me, um, players of, of that age. So we're talking, I guess, 15 and 16 year olds. Is that right? Or 16, 17, 16, 17. Age? Yeah. Yeah. Who are their idols? Who are their playing idols mm. for that age group? It's definitely like the Poulin, like Spooner. Yeah, kind of like the my age group, funny enough, that are still playing that have been, you know, you know Sarah Nurse, and um, you're definitely seeing that they're, they got to grow up watching them, which is really cool. Got it. I just, I, I and, and part of the reason I bring it up is I was talking with a, just in our local association group of kids and brought up Sidney Crosby. I said, said the kid, and they're like, who's that? And I'm like, dear God, like, what's going on? I know, on isn't it crazy? And they're just like, <laughs> they had no idea, but they they know all about Connor Bedard and these other these other players, so. Yeah, um, so true. You grew up in, in Newcastle, Ontario, small town. I understand you, you grew up playing with the boys. Um, it goes without saying there would have been a lot of drive, um, but – you know, for example, I know that, you know, part of your calling was, you know, you're a really strong skater. So I, I would think that that's partly drive. That's partly genetics, but you got to get exposed to some good coaching along the way to refine those skills. When, when you look back, what, what would have been some of the you know moments of serendipity where you just got them put in front of some really good people that sort of helped you along your own journey? I've been lucky that a lot of the way really like, um, you know, my minor hockey coaches playing boys and even going to the, when I went over to girls playing Durham West, um, I, I had coaches that were just so invested in the, the development part of, uh, of minor hockey, which is, which is huge. Um, 
And it's hard when I'm, because when you think about skating, right, a lot of it is when you are really young, that's going to set the foundation for you. And like you said, a big part of it is genetics um, and just work ethic. But my dad picked out some pretty good summer camps when I reflect back on it when I was a kid that, um, that I felt like I grew a lot in. Like I didn't skate all summer. That was never, I played a lot of sports. I think that was part of it as well. I was athletic. Um, But he had picked a few summer camps here and there where I, where I skated. And I remember growing a lot in those moments when you're not necessarily in season, if that makes sense. Totally. Totally. And, and, you know, when, if you were to advise, you know, say parents or, or, or coaches, um, you know, you mentioned skating, is there any other skills that you would say, you know, based on your own experience or just what you observe in the players that you're coaching today to say, Hey, really emphasize these skills at, at a young age, because these are going to be the, the building blocks. And, and, and partly because I think, it's so easy. And I, I think if I'm being honest, I think we're kind of part of the problem at the coaches site because we give coaches access to, you know, how the Dallas stars do their four mm. check. And it's, it's hard not to say, well, I want to not to teach that to your 11 year olds sometimes. <laughs> so, so true. And like, not yeah. just you guys, but like, yeah, I think as like, as coaches at any level, like you're watching the NHL and you're like, yeah, I can teach that. And you, but anyway, um, passing, just yeah. passing is the one of the biggest skill gaps I see um, at every level. And it's the difference between being able to play and be impactful at the highest because uh, you can't do it alone. Um, so I find like, like the best skaters and the best puck control players, like when the skill gap is different and m- women's hockey is growing. So I think that's going to change our game a little bit. Like long gone are the players that will dominate at every level and can skate it end to end. And, and score goals but you find that the faster skaters like can get away with it because they don't need to have to make plays with others as much and passing is such a skill gap so I think passing um kind of like we talked about earlier like that functional skill set like shooting is something that I've really found a, a real love for co- for teaching and coaching and really? it's really it's really hard and you think about how many minor co- hockey coaches exist like it's hard to teach that, especially at a really foundational level with, with, um, young kids. So I think when like, does that start, do you think like, when do you, when do you recommend? I, uh, we deal with, I just, this is a totally selfish question, but we do, I coach my little guys, U seven program and mm. shit. There's some kids we play against and they <laughs> like, they can go bar down and you know, <laughs> part of it's like, should we just be like, just doing stationary shooting all practice or, you know, or I'm like, is that how much of that is just kids picking up quickly? And, you know, is it better to focus maybe when they get a little bit stronger, like maybe you 11? I, and I don't have a, a great Yeah, answer. it's it's a great question. And I think about that age too. Like how hard is it to get those kids like focused on the ice when you have them like slowed down, like working on shooting, where a lot of the times at the younger ages, it's like hurting cats, like try to get oh. them to stay focused. And yeah, so like totally. realistically, like how are you ma- running a practice to truly get to slow down? So just in thinking out loud with you, I would like to think maybe a lot of it would be off ice a little bit. Maybe a lot of like we're in a practice structure where you get them for an hour. It's hard to really like utilize that effectively. So maybe a lot of it could, you could start to teach at that age off the ice. And like you said, once you get to you 11 and 12, where that foundation's built more, you can yeah. get it into practice easier, but when it's when they're starting from the get go, it's really hard to get into a practice structure. I think. Um, That's a great yeah, point. That That's would be my point. thought. Yeah, but edge work would be my last one. Edge work. Edge work. Edge work. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got it. We've been really fortunate. Um, we worked with Corey Chevrolet. Uh, we've worked with Carla McLeod, um, and 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 the list goes on. But I I, I do sense that. I think at in all sports, um, especially at the higher levels, you can identify coaching trees. And I think there's a really cool coaching tree that, you know, maybe hasn't fully blossomed yet, but we're going to look back and say, hey, there was a kind of a generation that you were a part of this with Hockey Canada where, you know, I, I can't say this from my lived experience. I sense that there's very much, you know, in the same way that there was that respect as a player that we want to see everybody do well and we're all on the same page that we're going to look back and say that, you know, um, you know, the success of women's hockey, and I don't want to say it's going to be completely dependent on, you know, hockey Canada, but I I think we're going to look back and say a lot of the leaders, the people that have pulled everybody forward, maybe kind of came out of those, 
you know, U18 camps and those selection camps and probably the conversations that happen after hours and just how do we all get better? Um, how, how valuable is that or was that experience just go, going through it and continuing to go through it and having that network? Yeah, like coaching at the U18 level and those camps. Yeah, and and just being a part yeah. of the mentorship and, you know, just sharing resources and information, et cetera. Yes, one. Oh, it's changed my career. And I was fortunate that um, I got to be a camp coach for the U18 program. Um, my first summer into coaching, so started at BU, and then that first summer I was a camp coach. And those the environment, like I found it addicting as a player, just as addicting as a coach. And when you get to put that many amazing people in a room that are just as passionate as you, that have different experiences, and just talking hockey and it's amazing and every time I go and that's why I keep coming back anytime they ask me is I grow so much as a person as a leader as a coach and you pull little things with you and you know something as simple as I've got to coach D zone and penalty kill for four years in a row now I've learned how to teach it differently every year through having that experience of working with different coaches and, and rolling it out differently with different players and in different environments. And yeah, I mean, I can't say enough about how much I've grown through those environments every time. That's really cool. And when you were playing, like, I mean, you jumped, you know, I know we were going back for the email and I said, like, it really seemed like based on your elite prospects, it, it, it seemed like you kind of had the, the suit ready to go as soon as you took your skates off for the last time you jumped right by him. Was that by design? Like, did you see this coming down the pipe and and were you preparing for it? Or was it literally like, Hey, this opportunity came with my alma mater with Brian DeRoche. And it's like, I gotta, I gotta jump in this because it might not be available down the road. I've always wanted to coach. And that's funny. You picked up on that. It's uh, and I can't remember how young, but I've always just been really drawn into like, whether I was watching a sports movie, like, for as long as I can remember, I was watching the coach and yeah. just drawn into like being a part of those inspiring environments and being motivated and a part of a team and uh, always been curious about how to get to be helping create those. And the longer I played in my career, like even I'm trying to make an Olympic team, knowing that like, this is my dream, but knowing how much it, that these experiences are going to help me down the road and how it's going to help me maybe get my foot in the door and I think the hardest part was like, it was just so hard to see a path into the coaching world, like how to, how not just to be a coach, but to make a living out of it. And I think that was always like the the scariest part is how do you really like try to make it sustainable? And um, I was so fortunate. I mean, the assistant coaches at BU were there for nine years before um, the job opened up. So I didn't necessarily like, I was primed and ready to move back to Ontario and make like nine grand being an assistant at a, as a youth sport coach. And I can't think about how different my career would have been sure, um, yeah. if this BU job didn't open up. And I am so grateful uh, that I got to really start here and hit the ground running. What would be some of the decisions or just, or way that you go about things and whether it's borrowed from a, a coach that you had as a player, but just in the way of like, it, it helps for you to be able to say like, Hey, this is, Cause I think there's always that line, right? There's the way you think you see things as a coach, but then there's that lens of like, I think there's value in saying, well, this, I know how a player is going to view this. And, and, and maybe, maybe I got to lean more on my player lens than I do my coaching lens. Um, can you give any examples of maybe just how you've set your program up to say like, you know, just like top of mind, like I think about like some coaches that have said, Hey, like, you know, when it comes to punctuality, like maybe there's, you know, it was just recently too, is, uh, I think, um, it was somebody was talking about Glenn say there and talking about how in the Oilers days, like that was one of his, you talk about the art of coaching. He was like, like, I'm not going to upset the apple cart because Yuri Curry's two minutes late for practice. Like we're going to still come in here and have a good day. And just, he just understood the dynamic of his team. And, and again, he was, you know, came from a playing background. Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I think the big thing, like being part of Hockey Canada for a long time, I saw the benefit of like having those high standards for just professionalism and how you show up as a person every day. And I think ultimately the way that I frame it with our group is similar to that. Like I'm not going to lose my mind if you're late for a meeting every once in a while, if it's like a one-off, right? Like we intervene when you see trends that could be impactful to 
your ability to elevate the group or just concerned to help you in general. Um, but we have high standards. And um, but I think it comes back to what we were saying with freshmen, bringing them in, like, you know, helping them create and have ownership over the environment that they want and teaching them that that how everyone shows up every day, you are contributing to the environment that you want for the group. And if you can't show up and contribute to it, then maybe you need to remove from it so that you can reset and we can help you and we can get you back to a point where you can contribute to it. Um, and that's always going to be my default. And it doesn't mean we don't mentor and support and guide in every scenario, but it's not just the culture and the environment doesn't happen to you. You interact with it every day and to help them learn that part of it. So I think to me, that's always been my approach in, in, in dealing with it. Um, but that comes from, I was a little, a little shit, if you will, as a player. Um, I yeah. was definitely, I grew up a lot. Um, and a lot of that really helps fuel my coaching um, philosophy and realizing that like how much your body language impacts the group, realizing how much, you know, every day we have the opportunity to elevate people around us and to realize like how special that is. And you're at the highest level. You have people from all over the world in this locker room. And that's the benefit of this experience. Um, so for them totally. to realize that the little things matter and it's things in my career that I learned sometimes a little bit way too late. Uh, but that's really what fuels my passion behind what I do and the environment we create. You know, you mentioned the international flavor in, in your locker room and you know, for example, I was looking at your roster for the U18 team. I think it's fair to say that traditionally, like when you grew up, probably the majority of the players came from Ontario. Like that was, and, and now it seems to be the di diversity on that roster just by province and representation is really growing. There was like three or four players from BC, Saskatchewan, et cetera. But then like we did, we have this series we do called Hockey Factories, and we profile five organizations per year. And one of the ones we did this past year was Lulia in, in, in Sweden, where they've really invested in their female program and they're seeing some, you know, yielding some great results. You're obviously looking under every stone and, you know, for, for talent. Could you maybe point to an area of the world where you're like, hey, this maybe isn't the, the obvious producer of, of, of female hockey players, but, you know, in the future, they they uh, they might be setting themselves up for success. Yeah, I think I mean I think you're seeing it all over Europe now to say the least. I mean, we have a commit from uh Czechia coming in who actually was on that U18 team. Um so you're seeing different pockets that country's really growing. I mean, look no further than the international stage, right? I think you're seeing that that impact um obviously in Sweden there I think they draw a lot of top European talent in because they have that kind of established league um at the at the highest levels but yeah I think you're seeing it all across the board it's really cool I think yeah you got to have your eyes open I think you're starting to see like certain areas of the world where people go to play when they get to the, like those higher levels and that's more um the scenario but yeah we're looking everywhere and I think different pockets of Europe you're really seeing a lot of growth Big, um, you, uh, you're post up in a, a, a pretty big sports market, lots of great coaches floating around. Um, if, if I gave you sort of carte blanche to go take any coach from any sport from anywhere out for lunch and pick their brain for an hour, who, uh, who are you inviting? Mm. Well, I'm a nerd for basketball. I couldn't give you like a specific really? Oh yeah, I couldn't give you a specific coach that I want to sit down with, but any of them really at the higher levels, college, NBA, um, WNBA, but there's so many similarities in our game and I really like to draw the correlation to it and love, uh, I actually picked our men's basketball coaches brains about rebounding earlier this year and had them run an off ice warm up for us. And um, so I think any, any coach kind of in, in basketball, I, I love picking their brain. I was in um, I was in Vegas last week, and and man, you could see the Las Vegas Aces stuff everywhere. And like Becky Hammond's a a rock star there. She would certainly she's somebody that we have eyes on to hopefully get out to our conference at, at some point down the road. I'd be curious on the base or sorry on the basketball front though. What about basketball strategically? Do you feel like you can borrow and and sort of implement into? into hockey. I've, and I, I'm, and I partly say that because it's actually Paul Vincent, who's from your neck of the woods, he's going to be presenting at our conference and it's going to be on stuff he's stolen from soccer 
or, or football mm. and implement it in hockey. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, the first thing that we, that we actually did this year was talking about rebounding, um, offensive rebounding more than anything. And so it's been really, it's really hard to teach in a practice because things happen so fast and to break down that awareness of when you're off the puck. And so we had our basketball coaches talk about like, if the shot is coming from this third of the court, the odds are the rebound's going to come out on that third of the court, which is the yeah, same as being off the 45s in hockey. And then one terminology that we've used is when you take a dead angle shot in hockey, the rebound goes out to the slot. But in basketball, they call that the nail because that's the one place on the court is right in the middle um, where the free throw line is, is they call it the yeah. nail. And that's where rebounds will come out. So um, just teaching them where rebounds will go, how to read off of um, where the shot's being taken. And then the other layer is the offensive contact which is the really hard part, especially in women's hockey, I don't think is taught a lot, is how do you earn that ice around the puck and in the scoring square so that you can bury it home and starting to think about initiating that contact before the shot is taken so that you can get the rebound. So that was one thing that we really uh, honed in on this year. Unfortunately, I found that our girls got way too preoccupied about the part of the drill about taking the three-point shot that they lost a little bit of focus on like the rebounding part, but either way, it was a Hold lot on. of fun. Were you actually taking your players out on the court and playing basketball? Yeah, we did it as like an off ice warm up. We went up there's our, our uh, basketball gym is actually above our ice rink. Um, and we got up there with the men's basketball coaches and they ran them through a little bit of an offensive rebounding drill that ended with a three pointer. And they were all just like so embarrassed about their three point shots that it turned into a real, it was really funny. <laughs> There, there's few things in life that's more comical than watching high level <laughs> hockey players try and play basketball. And I don't, it's so funny. Way. It, does, it doesn't <laughs> always translate, but uh, that's awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, Terry, you're going to be joining us in Ann Arbor at, uh, at TCS live. We're, we're stoked to have you on stage. I know we haven't talked about a topic yet, but um, yeah, just your own experience of, you know, you, you talked a lot about professional growth. Like how, um, what are you looking forward to in that experience? Anytime, like we were talking about, like anytime you can get a bunch of coaches in a room that are passionate about growing our sport, leading and pulling and having different conversations. I'm just so excited to, to get there and to interact with everyone and listen to everyone else's presentations and, and talk a lot of hockey and talk a lot about sport leadership. Awesome. Well, hey, Tara, listen, we, um, we're excited to have you join us there. And I think more than anything, we're really excited. I think there's there's just something to be said for we've had this unique experience where for the time that we've been doing this, seeing coaches that have become pals and watching them build their programs, have success, not only for themselves, but for their team. And um, it's a really exciting journey that you're on right now. And I uh, really appreciate you making time and sharing a bit of your story with us. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun.